author of your well? I'm going to talk to you today about food and how food is life. So food is indispensable to life. From, you know, aside from water, from the smallest bacterium to the largest animals and plants, everything requires food. It's a truly ubiquitous requirement. Food provides the energy to run life's processes, as well as the building blocks that make up life's structures. In that way, we really cannot do without food. And humans are no exception to this rule. Since our humble origins, a couple million years ago, depending on how you count it, what you think is the origin, food is perhaps one of those things that has most greatly influenced our journey to here. Um, to give you an example, think about cooking, you know, something as trivial as cooking. It, has, it is now believed that cooking was one of those things that enabled our brains to develop larger, uh, which in turn led to our, let's put it, cognitive supremacy over other life forms. And then, you know, maybe think about the transition from hunter-gatherer lifestyles to the first agricultural societies. Something that happened only about 10,000 years ago, relatively recently in the grand scheme of things. Think about how that's changed our culture, our interaction with each other, and affected our journey to here. And still today, food plays a crucial role in all of our societies. Although food production has changed, you know, food production now is a truly global phenomenon, a, a global industry, if you will. It happens all around the world, and it's been incredibly optimized, particularly over the past century. We grow relatively few species of living things for food, but we do it with extreme efficiency. Although less of us, in absolute terms, might be farmers than in the past, still a lot of us can say that they grow food for everyone else. And that's unlikely to change as we go forward. So despite, let's say, hunger not being a condition of the past, we can say we've done pretty well reaching this point. We're successfully feed feeding about 7 billion people. But things will need to change, because our food production practices are not maybe everything that they seem to be. Um, all of our food production is not sustainable, and we need to do something about these practices if we want to have a future on this planet. So let's look maybe at a few examples, right? Um, take soy. Soy is one of those things that is an essential requirement for growing meat, um, and for growing meat <laughs> at the price point that we've grown used to. Without soy, essentially a lot of our livestock farming would collapse. So it's quite funny to think that a lot of soy is grown in geographically very specific parts of the world. And regions like Europe tend to rely on external exports um, in order to bring protein in. Then, let's consider the intensity of farming, right? So, look at synthetic fertilizers, for example. Synthetic fertilizers are an absolute requirement, again, to grow the crops in the amounts that we've grown used to. Now, be as important as they are, the production of synthetic fertilizers themselves causes quite a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, and their usage on the soils contributes to a direct loss of soil health. But perhaps one of the most striking features, which I'm not sure every one of you knows about, is the inefficiency of our food production systems. About one third of all food produced is wasted each year. Now, that's quite a lot. You don't need to be an expert to know that. It's about 1.3 billion tons around the world each year. That's a large number. I don't have it there, but it's a large number. You can trust me on that one. And all of this waste, you know, it's, it's not just lost value. Actually, it contributes to quite a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. And the FAO puts this quite neatly in a way that everyone can sort of understand. If food waste were its own country, it would be the third largest polluter after the USA and China. So that's, let that sink in <laughs> for a second. Now, if all these problems weren't enough, uh, we are kind of on track for global population expansion. 
around 9 billion people by 2050. Now, that's a pretty large number. And the least we can do for everyone, if we're going to keep on cracking on with that, is to make sure they're fed. Um, and if we want to feed everyone, we have to change our food production practices and we have to make it more sustainable. Now, if what I just said hasn't left you kind of spiraling down in a vortex of existential dread, keep on listening to me, um, because there are solutions that can help us address these problems. For starters, I'm going to say this. There's no single solution that's suddenly going to you know, wipe all these problems away and solve all of our problems. But there are multiple solutions which might be able to interact with each other and help us achieve this. And today, I'm going to tell you about one of them. And it's quite an unusual one, uh, but it makes for quite good theatre. So I and a growing number of people now believe that insects, that's right, insects, are going to be one of these driving forces for future food production. I see my slides have gotten lost. <laughs> Anyway, insects are going to help us solve some of these problems. But let's take a step back and think about how insects might achieve this. So you might have recently clocked um, on the news uh, this you know, phenomenon of all insect populations around the world collapsing. So there's been a crazy reduction in species diversity and in the biomass amount of insects around the world. And Maybe to most of you, it's like, why do I care? You know, it's insects. It's, does it really matter? Um, but it does. It really does. You have to think that insects originated on this planet around 500 million years ago. They were the first truly terrestrial animals. You know, for context, I said humans were only a couple millions old. And now, with insects, they've really kind of developed a lot. Most of the species we know, about 80% of all known species, is insects. Um, but also, if you look in terms of mass, if you were to put all the animals in this world you know, on a, on, on a scale, um, about 50% of that biomass would be insects. So that's quite a large you know, fraction. And this kind of shows the role insects have in the ecosystem. They're absolutely essential in pretty much all ecosystems and all cyclings of nutrients on this world, and therefore food production. So to give you an example, uh, take pollination, right? All of you will be familiar with the bee. Uh, the bee is one of the most sort of well-known pollinators, and pollination is one of those processes that underpins the performance of crops around the world. If bees were to go, um, our crop production would stop and we would all starve to death, or a very significant fraction of us would. But that's not all. There's actually a very interesting role insects do, and that's waste recycling, biomass recycling. So think about you know, dead wood, carry-on, dead plants, fruit, all this kind of biomass waste that would otherwise accumulate around us is actually converted a lot of the time into new nutrients through insects. And that's the concept I'd like you to focus on going forward because this concept of insect biomass conversion is the key to the role insects will play in the future in our food production systems. So the concept is actually quite simple. Take you know, any kind of biomass waste, such as food waste, feed it to insects, which in the process will be able to convert waste biomass into their own bodies. Um, and by doing so, they turn this into protein and fat. Now, protein and fat are very valuable. We need them in our diets, our farmed animals needed in their diets. So the insect is kind of able to take this problem, you know, food waste, and turn it into an opportunity for production of renewable nutrition. It's not too dissimilar to how insects were used in some of our societies in the past. But unlike insects, you know, which convert waste to bacon, um, insects bring some interesting extra features to the table. So they're able to pretty much eat most types of waste. You name a waste, there's an insect that can eat it. 
They can achieve this conversion very quickly, so a lot of species that are commonly farmed are going to be able to grow over a thousand fold in biomass over a period of just two weeks. That's, you know, it, it's kind of crazy. Um, if you look at the sustainability metrics of it, you know, they use sort of minimal land, minimal water consumption, and when you look at greenhouse gas emissions, if you compare this to composting or anaerobic digestion, insects are a lot more sustainable. But perhaps one of the most striking features is that insect or insect technology, if you can call it a technology, and I think you can, is a truly global technology. It's not rocket science at the end of the day. It's something that can be done both in developing and developed countries alike. So from this perspective, insects can become a protein commodity of the future. And when it comes to their uses, I mean, there are many. The industry at the moment is focusing on two, animal feed and human food. If we look at animal feed first, it's perhaps the m larger focus for obvious reasons, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but animal feed composed by insects is, in many ways, more of a back-to-the-roots approach rather than a proper innovation. A lot of farmed animals, think poultry or salmon, will naturally consume insects in their diets. So feeding them insects, highly nutritious, is actually a very sustainable approach. If we think about human food, on the other hand, I mean, probably all of you will be like, it's not going to happen anytime soon. And I think I agree with you on that one. It's not going to happen overnight. But it is happening. Um, and over the next decade or so, we're likely to see more and more food products made with insects, or the insects themselves, make their way in our supermarkets. So there's a lot of insect farmers sprouting up around the world, you know, almost on a daily basis now, all convinced that this is going to be one of the ways in which we can build a more sustainable food production system of the future. But many issues still remain. With insect farming being so new, it's actually, it, the regulation is quite archaic and not specific for insects. So unlike pigs, you know, insects can live at higher densities and in different sorts of environments, which means that the same rules don't necessarily apply to all farmed animals. So more research is needed in these topics to be able to craft the right kind of regulation that maximizes the impact of this technology, whilst also protecting the consumer from harm. To give you an example of this, um, currently in Europe, you can only feed insects on food grade materials. So that's, um, you know, think about food waste originating from factories, but we cannot feed them things, you know, food waste originating from restaurants, because that's um, non-food grade. Um, if we were able to do that in the future, and if we were able to do that safely, then the impact of this kind of approach could really increase. But then, you know, at the end of the day, the most important driver for all of this is, is us. It's, it's the consumer. So it's the consumer that shapes up what ends up in our supermarkets, and it's the consumer that kind of sets the tone for adoption of these kind of new technologies. So many of you might have not been aware of insects or insects as food and feed until today. But I'm trying to stress that going forward, there's a real importance here to communicate transparently and to let the consumer know all the information so that eventually we might start adopting, you know, insect-based foods or, or direct insect foods in our supermarket systems. Um, and I'm going to leave you with the thought that I've started to really kind of live by <laughs> over the past couple of months. Um, I want to make insects great again going forward. Thank you very much. <laughs>